Hi, YF. Really glad to have all of you here with us today on a Sunday morning, despite us not being able to meet together physically. Okay, I hope everyone's feeling okay and making themselves comfortable at home while tuning in to the sermon today. I'll be sharing based on Mark 3, 31-35, titled Caught as God's Family. Okay, so I'm sure every one of us have asked very ridiculous or silly questions or made very absurd comments before, right? It's like when I watch Korean dramas and someone returns home, the wife, the husband, or the child will always ask, oh, you're home? It might be cultural, asking this to be polite, to acknowledge someone is home. But if we think about the actual question asked, it's like asking the obvious, right? The person is physically at the door, so of course the person is home. And even amongst ourselves, we ask the most obvious kind of questions like, oh, you cut your hair? Oh, you went to paint your nails? Oh, hey, you're back from overseas already. If we were to think about all of these questions, it's really quite ridiculous, right? Like, we can clearly see that our friends are before us, our friends have a new haircut, or our friends have done their nails. It's so clear that the answer is before us, but yet we still ask such questions. This was the kind of question that Jesus asked in Mark 3, 31 to 35. Jesus was in a house preaching and teaching to a crowd seated around him and just spending time with those who came to see and hear him. And while Jesus was in the midst of his ministry, his mother and brothers also came and stood outside. They waited outside for him. So here it really seems like they came here because of Jesus, that they wanted to talk to him, that they wanted to get his attention, because they actually asked someone to go into the house to pass the message to Jesus that they are outside. But when Jesus got the message that his family members were outside waiting for him, looking for him, he actually asked this question, who are my mother and brothers? Now, normally if you call out to your family member from like a distance away, you would expect that they would respond by going towards you, right? Or maybe they will ask you, what is it? Or is there a question that you have for me? Or is there something that you need my help with? But as for Jesus, he replied with a question asking who his mother and brothers are. And I believe at that time, probably everyone in the house was quite stunned. Like, hmm, what sort of question is that? There are people, these are people living with, who live with Jesus, who also grew up with Jesus under the same roof. So it's impossible that Jesus wouldn't know who they are, right? Even the people that seated around Jesus at the house at the time recognized them as Jesus' family. They called these people your mother and brothers when they spoke to Jesus. So there was really no doubt about their identity and everyone acknowledged them as his family. So over here, it really seemed like Jesus asked a very absurd question. It almost borders on being very rude, very dismissive, and it sounded like Jesus was just disowning his family members in front of the crowd and even in front of his family members as well. But Jesus asked such a ridiculous question because he had a very important message to tell us. In Mark 3, 31 to 35, Jesus was describing, he was redefining, he was painting a picture of who his family really is. So when Jesus heard that his natural family were looking for him, instead of acknowledging them, he looked around the room at the people who were sitting around him and declared that they are his mother and brothers and that whoever does God's will is his brother, sister, and mother. This tells us that firstly, God's definition of his family has some differences from how we understand family to be in our society. In our society, a family are people who are related by blood, like parents and children or siblings. They can also be recognized legally as a family, like through marriage or adoption. It means that only this group of people have the privilege to be a part of this particular family. So when Jesus asks who his mother and brothers are, it tells us that our human way of understanding family is insufficient to understand God's family. It does not fully encompass the way God's family operates. And Jesus was basically rejecting what we thought was indisputable, which is that family equates to those who share blood relations or are recognized in the eyes of the law. And just really telling everyone that no one has privileges over another in becoming a part of God's family. So who are a part of God's family? Jesus makes it very clear that everyone who does his will is a part of his family. Jesus describes God's family as people who has this characteristic. They lead a life that is in obedience to God, that strives to honour and worship him through their daily lives. Like the crowd in the passage, 
Jesus referred to them as his family because they have chosen on that day. You know, instead of spending their time elsewhere, they chose to be with him, to spend time sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him. They were being obedient to God's call to draw close to him and to be with him. Such is God's family. Jesus is telling us that obedience to God is a characteristic of his family. It is something that families of members of God's family do. In every family, there are certain things or certain practices that we do and bite to, right, that are important to the family. For example, it could be routines like visiting our grandparents over the weekends, or just simple chores that have become an expectation or a norm within the family, like maybe you know, placing the remote controls at a certain part of the house, um, placing our, keeping our ironing board in another part of the house. Yeah, so maybe for the rest of us, you know, some of us might see having family dinners as important, we set aside maybe every Sunday tonight to eat together. As members of this family, we make sure that we don't schedule anything else on a Sunday night. We make sure that we get home on time. We make sure that we are present for the family dinner. We honour these family practices and we abide to them because we are a part of this family. And these practices are an expectation of us and these are what's important to the family. It's also the same for my family too. So one practice that is very important to us is cleaning up after we have eaten, washing the dishes, making sure that the kitchen, the dining area is clean. And my parents are very strict about it. It really matters to them. We need to do it immediately. You know, like once we put our bowls in the sink or once we have finished eating, we need to bring it in, we need to wash up, we need to clean up the place. There's really no room for negotiation on this. Because if we delay this, you know, by spending our time on other things instead, it means that there's a pile of dirty and unwashed dishes in the sink, right? There's also mess on the table, and this really upsets my parents. So cleaning up promptly you know, and keeping the place clean is very important in my family. But there are times that, you know, probably like most of us, we just want to rest, relax at home after a long day at work. You know, I just want to catch up on my TV shows, read the messages that I haven't read, you know, look through Instagram, read the news. Yeah, so after a long day of work, I just really want to rest. You know, and I think that, okay, I'll wash up when I'm done doing all these things that I want to do. But when any of us children procrastinate in clearing our dishes, procrastinate in cleaning up the place, it really upsets my parents. And they make the ultimate comment, mm, you treat this place like a hotel, ah. you, know, you think we are your servants. You know, so when these words were said, you know, I mean, I'm not very sure how um, serious they were about it, but when these words were said, I was quite taken aback because I didn't have any intentions at all to make them feel this way. And I never had such thoughts as well. What they felt was definitely not what I felt. But their words clearly showed their anger and disappointment, that I failed to obey them and abide to what really matters to them. Their words conveyed their feelings that perhaps I didn't care about what they cared for and didn't honour their words or obey their instructions. That I simply wasn't behaving like I was a part of the family and in their eyes, Maybe my actions did not reflect that I treated the place like my home. But on the contrary, if my friends were to do, come over and visit me, come over to my place, and didn't do the same, will my parents scold them? No, right? My friends will not be held to the same expectations. Because they aren't part of the family, you know, they're simply not required to do the same thing. There are people who are just here temporarily. Are, it is not their home as well. And when they don't abide to such family rules you know, or family practices, it also clearly shows that they aren't part of the family because they don't know the practices of this family and it's not something that's important to them. And in this aspect, it is the same in the family of God too. There are standards to uphold. There are actions, behaviours, decisions we make that reflects our identity, whether we are children of God and whether we are part of his family. In verse 35, Jesus clearly tells us that obedience to God is necessary if we call ourselves his family. Because all who are God's family have this one characteristic, obedience. If we proclaim that we are children of God, that we belong to this family of faith, then do our lives reflect that we know and we prioritise obedience to God? Our behaviours, our decisions, our actions have to reflect obedience. And this can be practised in our everyday lives, whether we're at home, or at school, in church, or really just anywhere else. For example, and when we're in school, you know, when we have a class test to do, and our friend next to us didn't have enough time to finish studying for her test. And she turns and asks us for answers. How do we respond to this friend? 
Or when we are done with our O-level exams, A-levels, final year poly exams, and our group of friends are planning for a graduation trip. And we really want to join them because it's so exciting right, to go out on a trip with our friends. But our parents are against it. They say no to us going on this trip. What is our response? Or when there's an outcast in our class, someone who many other classmates make fun of, and is often left out when it comes to group work, or even recess time. How do we treat that classmate? And how do we behave amongst the rest of our classmates? And when there are newcomers who join YF or even join our CG, how do we treat them? There are ways that we can decide you know, in terms of how we want to respond in such situations. Do we choose to stand firm against such negative peer pressure and not resort to lies and deception through cheating? Do we choose to honour and respect our parents and the decisions that they make? Do we also choose to put aside our biases and sincerely just befriend those around us, regardless of how well-liked they are or not, or if they are new to us? As children of God, as His family, are we walking in obedience to God in our everyday lives, trusting in Him that He, that he strengthens us to do so despite the circumstances that we find ourselves in? Or perhaps might we instead subconsciously think that as children of God, as His family, that God ought to listen to us, to our requests, you know, and respond in ways that we expect Him to do so. You know, in this passage, um, Jesus' natural family taught that they, as blood-related family members, have the privilege that others don't, you know, that Jesus will respond to them in a way that they expect He would. So when they sent a message to Jesus, right, that they were outside, you know, waiting for Him, looking for Him, instead of going in, you know, they remained there, they remained outside, waiting for Jesus to come out to speak to Him. Jesus' natural family's actions and attitudes, waiting outside the house, expecting Jesus to come out, expecting Jesus to respond in the way that they want him to, is contrasted here with Jesus' true family's actions and attitudes, sitting at his feet in the house, responding to Jesus' call to spend time with him, which is an act of obedience as well. Could we or might we be, mim be mirroring Jesus' natural family members' attitudes and actions? because of our status as his children, maybe we have certain expectations of the ways we want God to respond to our requests. Instead of submitting to his will, many a times we end up imposing our will on him. You know, we get upset, frustrated, angry when the outcome isn't what we had asked for. Here I must really say that it is really perfectly normal and right to ask God for what we want and to trust and have faith that what we ask for in prayer, he will give to us. God is definitely not heartless. He's not out there to force us to just submit you know, to whatever He wants us to do and in the process, dismiss all our requests and deprive us. God is, isn't only able to speak, but not hear as well, right? He hears us too. But when we pray for, whatever we pray for, whatever we ask for, if all these things does not turn out the way we want it to, how does it change the way we behave and think? Will we still choose to, tr to trust in God and lead a life that is obedient to Him? Maybe some of us have been praying for something or had been praying for something very important to us. Maybe it's an admission to our ideal school or a scholarship or an internship. But for some reason, we didn't get it. So when this happens, what is our attitude towards God? While God hears us and knows what we want, God is also an all-knowing God and His ways are higher than our ways. We may not always understand everything that happens and everything that He does, Despite this, do we choose to continue trusting in Him and leading a life of obedience to Him? God calls everyone who does His will, who leads a life of obedience to Him, as His family. It really means that God's family is for everyone. The borders of His family is now open to anyone and everyone who follows Jesus, who does God's will and who obeys Him. And if we say that we belong to God's family, we need to really examine our hearts and our lives. Do our actions and thoughts reflect our belonging to God's family? Our lives tell others who we are. If we are children of God, let's live out our faith through obedience to God in our lives. Good morning, church. My name is Roslyn, and I am the chairperson of this year's Easter event, TPMC Gives. You know, with the cloud of COVID-19 hanging over us, let's not forget that this year is TPMC's 50th anniversary. 
a year of jubilee, ushering in a season of restoration of wholeness. You know, even though we are not able to meet physically for the next two weeks, I want to borrow the words of Craig Groeschel that says, God is not calling us to go to church. He is calling us to be the church, the hope of the world. As such, this Easter, we celebrate Jesus. We remember that Jesus gave of his body and blood on the cross to save us, to restore us. In that same way, we want to do the same through TPMC Gifts, which is a two-day event where we distribute bread and donate blood. Now, this is a symbolic act where we represent the saving work of Jesus to the community in Topayo. Details of the event can be found on our church website and social media platforms. Registrations start today. You can register through the links provided online. Come, register as a blood donor or a bread distributor, better yet, both. Let's together, as God's people, bring hope and cheer to the community that he has placed us in for the past 50 years. God bless you.